and welcome to episode 47 of the Hellbound Podcast. I'm Vicky Aurora, this is... Alex Blackburn. Hey! <laughs> How you doing? Doing alright, yeah, doing alright. I'm just going to uh, adjust your mic slightly. Oh no. Because... I'm you, too loud. Can you see those levels there? Well, this hanging bag is in the way. Okay, well, this is about, this is about right now, okay. so we just need to talk... Normally... Should we start again? No, we're not starting again. This is the intro. Oh, so, no. hello everyone. Uh, if you've not already heard my wife on this podcast, nice healthy levels there, you see on Audacity, that's the software we used. Not our sponsor currently. We want them to be, because they're excellent. They the make Audacity. excellent software. The Audacity of it! <laughs> uh, we don't need it to spike like I just did there, so... Just okay. need to keep the levels nice and conversational. So, episode 47, Vic, what are we going to talk about? So you want me to have a conversation with you? Yeah, uh, a conversation that is audible and can be heard by millions of millions. I'll tell you what we'll talk about. We'll talk about this new poster that you seem to have magically appeared in your room. Oh, you've uh, you just I've noticed. (laughs) Uh, uh, What's the what's the poster? Experience the original summer blockbuster. Jaws. Director Steven Spielberg invites you to see it in IMAX. And real D three D for the first time, so it must have been on IMAX at some point. Released September the 9th, and we went to see it. We did go and see it. Don't ask me where I got the poster. How much it cost me? That's just its uh, own story in itself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> did it cost uh, more than the tickets? It cost more than the tickets, yeah. But that's um, it's cheaper than the original poster from nineteen seventy five. The original poster is like three hundred pounds. The original poster is six hundred pounds. Uh, and it's not possible to get one because they're in terrible condition and I wouldn't get one. So you bought yourself a birthday present? Yeah. And a, a va- month and a advanced, after? Uh, no, like a 2023 birthday present. Oh, so advanced. I don't need to get you anything now. Uh, Happy birthday. Oh, no, we've... <laughs> that's what the... Yeah, anyway. Um, so yeah, we went to see Jaws and we went to see it on IMAX. Um, I, didn't know, I didn't think you knew that it was on IMAX initially until like the last minute. Yeah, uh, it is one of my all-time favourite films. I love it, love it, love it. I've seen it quite a number of times. Have you ever seen it in the cinema? Never, until okay. now. And I didn't just see it in the cinema, I saw it in IMAX. I'm not a massive fan of IMAX. I find those teeny tiny seats just ridiculous. Uh, so what's what's wrong with the IMAX experience for you, uh, generally? I get a bit of neck ache. I went to see, I can't remember what it was, in IMAX 3D, and I got a bit like a motion sickness. Right, okay. So, Probably Avatar. No, it wasn't. Oh, uh, Gravity. No. Not gravity? It was a midnight show in Star Wars. One of those Star Wars. One of the terrible new ones. Yeah. Yeah, IMAX for me is it is awesome, but it is, depending on which IMAX you go to, I guess, the seats aren't fantastic. And now they've started to port, uh, in view cinemas at least, they've put leather recliner seats... But it seems to be any other, every other screen apart from IMAX itself because of the tiered seats. Yeah, and I get it because you're wanting to cram people into a smaller space. Yeah, sardines, yeah. But for your money, you should at least be able to enjoy it. You, may, you should be able to sit comfortably and enjoy it and not feel like you can't move a muscle because you're all so close together. Yeah, plus the, um, the cup holders are like a French Renault Clio car. Because they're tiny, they're like for hmm, you little espresso, and that's all it all it seems to be for. <laughs> or like a sippy cup. Yeah, because if you've got like a big gulp, like an American sized uh, three pint cup. Okay, when have you ever had one of those? I've had big gulp ones, but you know what I mean. You can't put your cinema drink that you purchased downstairs. You take the escalator up, then you walk to your screen, and then you go to your cup holder. What can you put in there? Your you keys can. for your you car. You can't even put it in there. Exactly, so that's what silly. I'm saying. Yeah. So, and so uh, that aside, v- view Ellesmere Port, uh, Cheshire Oaks. Get your act together. Change your seats, please. That aside, the most amazing IMAX experience ever. The film is incredible. Yeah. I can't stop thinking about it. Yeah, and uh, we don't care. <laughs> the films, the film is uh, how many years? Thirty, fifty years? No, seventy-five. Almost 50 47. years. 47. 47 years old. Is it 47 years old? Yeah, and we're on the 47th episode. 
Yes. That's crazy. Your brother and my sister were born in 1975. <laughs> Given their age away. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, shout out to Perma if you listen. You better be. Get our numbers shout up. Shout out to Miguel. Oh. Um, so, yeah, for a film that's re- released in 1975, to see on the big screen for the third time for me and the billionth time, generally. Yeah. Uh my apprehension going in because in like mid 90s they they released a version of it and the sound was remixed and it's the same sound mix as that that version of the film they f- they funked the colors a little bit well th- those colors were the scenes in the, o- the like the Chrissy Chrissy when Chrissy Watkins the Chrissy Watkins <laughs> the first victim to the shark on Amity uh, Island um they brightened it in the mid 90s version ah so it was already brightened and there were scenes just so you could see a little bit more. Oh, you could see more. A little bit of titty. <laughs> titty witty. Titty bitty titty. Titty bitty titty. Um, <laughs> just so you could see more of that. And it seemed very, very odd. It was much darker. I've got a VHS of the darker version. Yeah. Like the image is darker, not the tone. Yeah. Um, And it it does look better, but it's like, why mess with that? And then the mix of the, like the explosion of the shark, there's like, it sounds like, a car exploding or glass exploding there's a very right. weird sound they add to it um at the end of the film and it, the sound in, of in this, this version in this ver- no the 97 oh. onwards, and the sound of the boat getting hit when they're drinking yeah. it's like that the wood doing that it, those sounds are added in and it really kind of jarred with me because i'd seen it a thousand times yeah i used to watch it once but a this week. was a cleaner well-rounded well yeah it's, balanced well, it's the same version as that, but it, I've forgiven it. I've forgiven it because you know. Why... Were you caught up in it all? I was caught up in it all because it was, it was so the good. it was the greatest film. I think it's the greatest film ever, um, and it's one of the greatest horror films ever. Aha! Back on point. <laughs> and yeah, it was a truly cinematic experience. What bit were you scared of the most? I'm not scared of any of it. Um, I think the scariest thing for me. Not as scared of maybe. It's the it's the bit where, um, uh, Matt Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfus, drops the spear gun, the spear thing with the poison that he's injected in. He's dropped While it, he's realizes, the and then he turns around. He sees the shark before you do, and it's like a big close up of the shark hitting the cage. Yeah. And anyone, anyone watching this movie. And this is a little shout out to the epic uh, and legendary Joe Owls who designed the shark. Yeah, yeah. Worked for Hitchcock, John Carpenter. Previous judge. Previous judge of the Hellbound Horror Festival. Friend of. Friend, friend of the show show. Mm. Um, he, uh, an, a, a true legend, Oscar nominee, BAFTA winner. And a really nice encounters. guy. Really nice guy. Uh, shout out to him and his family. Um, it, how can you say it's not effective? That shark looks amazing. I think the only one scene that is a little bit like Moby Dick is when the shark jumps out of the water and lands on the boat. And then it's the scene with... Um, yeah, but you're so in it at that point, you forgive it. Like, that's it's tense and it's yeah, you forgive exciting. It. And For me, it was the, the leg of the... Dare I say it? The gross man. Oh, the guy in the red boat that's watching the young boys yes. uh, rowing in the pond, as they call Hello, it. Hello, little boys. Uh, and if the pond is for old ladies, as uh, Brody's son says, Michael. Uh, Michael, well done. Um, as and Michael says, oh, so pond's for ladies. Well, I'm your old man. Do the do me a favor or something. Whatever the line is. Um, why is the guy rowing the boat there in the red boat? I never understood that. It's very very creepy. Boys, what are you doing? Mm, he's coming Hello, close. Boys. Yeah. So it's a little bit, a little bit sus, a little bit sus. Well, well he gets it done in, and that's one of the best deaths where the camera's above the oh, boat, it's so good. and you see the shark profile swimming sideways, and just like eh, gets the guy and pulls and him the down. Leg. And, eh, I love the music. The music drops, and then the camera move along past the sun. Yeah, it's just it's glorious. Isn't it? Is there anything you noticed in it this time you hadn't noticed before? I think maybe how how much longer it was than I thought it was going to be. Like, yeah. that, and then I remembered, I don't know whether, because you're in a cinema, so you can't go anywhere, so it feels longer. But it also goes really quickly because the film is really good. 
the writing was incredible. The relationship yeah. between Brody and his wife is just great. Yeah, it's the first time I've noticed that they've got a little dog. That Brody's wife's got a dog. Um, it's so good. Oh, it's so so good. The kind of the um, like a bit of the suicide mission that Quint was on. Yeah, I think I think he the end doesn't. Of it. After he tells that story about the USS Inde- Indianapolis, Indianapolis. I oh, yeah, I can't pronounce it. I can't pronounce it. Uh, is there's a point where he decides it's a suicide mission? I think it's when he sees it. Yeah. That we need a bigger boat moment. He's like, shit. I'm not going to defeat this. Yeah. I there's... need to. I need to sacrifice for others to survive. Yeah. What's your um, What's your favorite scene of the film? Oh, that is a good one. Um, what's my favourite scene? Oh, come on, Al. That's a difficult. Maybe when the the end bit. Smile. I got. I got. I got oh, that smiley son of a bitch. Oh, spoilers. The shark dies. Uh, I think I've got two scenes. The one. Oh, sorry. I'm going to tell you mine. So you might have. You might. Well, can I, I also? Well, you've already asked. You asked me first. So let me answer. Okay, you tell the, me. The also the second one when they're all those fishermen are going out to try and catch it. The fishermen, oh, non-fishermen, all it's the like random. A, it's like some sort of three stooges or. Um, the randoms come out of the woodwork. Yeah, yeah, they're all like. Throwing dynamite into the water. Three grand, was it? Yeah, yeah. Three thousand bucks, chief. <laughs> what? Um, yeah. A uh, what? Um. <laughs> What's yours? Go on. My favorite. My two favorite scenes is when. Uh, Brody's lost all faith, and he's with his son around the dinner table. Oh. And it is really a emo- beautifully emotional scene. It's an emotional scene. Where his the little boy's mimicking his dad, which yeah. is so relatable, and the mum's standing by the door, and she's watching. just watching this beautiful moment between father and son. Um, but then Brody comes in. Uh, no, sorry, Ho- Matt Hooper comes in with the, with, uh, the wine. with the wine. He brought red and white wine, and then he starts to eat their dinner. Is anyone eating that? And then he brings the the comedy, the, the, the levity mood. to it, and and we didn't realise that Brody's already drunk. Uh, I think we did. And then he's using a water glass for his wine, and that's it's just so funny. <laughs> and he's pouring it, and Brody uh, Hooper stops him, like he puts his two finger gesture up to stop the wine. And then he says, "I can do anything. I'm the chief of police." Because then he's going to carve the shark open. Well, to I, th- find th- I, th- it's I think the um, killed a boy or not. Yeah, I think the the thing is Brody's really emotive. Like he feels it all. Like and he feels the weight of. The guilt, I think, yeah. of not following his instincts of closing the beach. Like he couldn't, he wasn't strong enough, and he paid the ultimate price. Or and that was really difficult. For, it's hard for anybody to try and get over that. And in that small scene was showed how deep into his kind of depression or despair he was, looking at his own child. You know, thinking it could have been him. And then Hooper coming in. Yeah gave that levity that was needed because it is it's a heavy topic yeah it's it's heavy in part absolutely um and my second favorite scene is when they're gonna shoot the first barrel and it's the john williams music and then uh quint tells hooper to tie the wire of the gun harpoon gun shot like a shotgun to the first barrel but then Hooper decides to go and get his detector thing. Yeah, yeah. So he can detect where it Hooper. is. Hooper! Uh, uh, Stay with the barrels. Hooper, tie it, will ya? He says, uh, <laughs> your turn, Quinn. And then he runs and it's the music, it's the build-up, it's the build-up. So I was just... It's, it's just Brody's beautiful. naivety in Absolutely that as well. Absolutely beautiful, yeah. Going into it thinking it was, you know, just going to happen with one barrel. Exactly. And this being one of Spielberg's first feature films... Is insane, isn't it? It's absolutely insane. It's like it's, it's perfectly third... crafted film. It's it's just crazy. There is a six degrees of separation. It's cool. not six degrees, but it's a few. I was working on a feature film in two thousand and seven uh, called Shattered in the U.S. and 
Uh, it was called uh, Butterfly and a Wheel in the UK. Uh, and it was Piers Brosnan, Gerald Butler, Maria Bello. And when I was assisting the guy doing the temp music, temp music's put in uh, so they can edit to the music and then, mm. they, then they have someone to score it properly after. That's how generally majority of films don't, they don't necessarily have a composer in straight away. Mm. So the guy that was working on, I think it was Mike Hyam, when he was working on the temp music, he's worked with Tim Burton. He's worked, he did the audio recording on set for Sweeney Todd. He's mm. worked on loads of big stuff. And the nicest guy, so I was work, helping him for a few weeks on this project, on this on this $30 million film. Yeah. So I met loads of people. And when one day when I was working with him, he got a phone call. And yeah. he's like, oh, I've got to take this. You can stay here. Do you, you? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll be quiet. I'll be quiet. And I could hear this gruffly old American voice on the phone. Yeah. And he was telling, and he was like, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can be there. No problem at all. That, that sounds great, Richard. And then I said, oh, th- thanks. I could hear him say, thanks, Mike, on the phone really thick American old accent yeah. and then Mike turns to me and he's like not a white like white face like I've seen a ghost but he was and then he turned to this massive smile said what's going on mate you gonna tell me because we were really friendly he was in the industry I'm not I was just some sort of post-production assistant runner type he says yeah that was Richard Zanuck I said Richard Zanuck you mean the guy who was I think his dad was head of 20th Century Fox who produced wow. Jaws? I said that's Richard Zanuck you were just talking to. Yeah, and he, Richard Zanuck had produced a lot of '70s movies. He produced a lot of Tim Burton movies. Yeah, and he was offering Mike the job to go work on Sweeney Todd. Ah, and he was picked because Tim Burton loved working with Mike on set. Mm. And um, yeah, he worked with him on Charlie and Chocolate Factory and all that. So I heard Richard Zanuck's voice on the phone, who produced Jaws, mega producer at the time. He's passed away now, but. Mega, mega producer. So it was quite... That was a... He says, do you know Richard Zanuck? I don't know him, but I (laughs) know him. So it was a really kind of magical moment, you know. So anyone to do with Jaws. Like, having having Joe Owls as a judge, and I've spoken to him in this room about designing the shark in Jaws. I know, it's mad. Working on creating the massive sets on Escape from New York. and. But that's uh, a testament to if you're a good guy... And you work well in a specific industry, then you'll do do well, no? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's recognised. And um, networking is is a big, big thing, and you're know, taking those moments, not sucking up all the information, not kind of embarrassing yourself, listening listening when you should listen, and keeping stum when you need to keep stum. Um, super important. But then you acting upon advice of others and. You know, stepping forward, there's opportunities I missed out on, like Band of Brothers, which I should have been runner on. Um, but yeah, you, you can't wallow in uh, regret what and self pity because that's kind of pathetic, and you kind of ruin your life that way, and you end up becoming miserable. So. Onwards and upwards. Onwards and upwards, and yeah, Jaws has had a huge impact on me and my life, and that was why it was so great to go and see it on IMAX. So then, seeing Joe Alves' name on the end oh, credits, yeah. and the fact that he, you know, been a judge. Um, on the festival, so it's a really kind of nice way to round it off, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. But yeah, it was a great experience, and it was nice to see a bunch of people there. And you know, for a film that's almost forty-seven years old, um, what was oh, that fact about how much money it made? And oh, it made like it was—it was the summer blockbuster. It made like four hundred and fifty million dollars in nineteen seventy-five. Massive. 1975. It's because it's because you can go back and watch it over and over and over again. Oh yeah, and people are scared to go to the water now. I used to have nightmares when I used to go in the shower, close my eyes, and I'd see the shark coming towards me, <laughs> just because the water was touching that my was face. Just a rubber ducky. That was just a rubber ducky. <laughs> ducky. Um, but yeah, it was an absolutely beautiful experience, and yeah, I. I'd probably go and see it again. Have you seen it in normal cinema and not IMAX? Like the, uh, the last two, the last two, I've only seen it three times in the cinema, only. Um, I saw it in normal, a thirty-five mil print. So, excuse my ignorance. What is Real D three D? Oh, it's just three D. It's just a brand. Real D three D. I hate three D. It's just the it's just the sales term for it. So they're not they haven't released it on two D back in the cinemas again. It. It will have been, yeah. yeah. It would have been 2D, 3D and IMAX. Yeah. Um, but the best experience was IMAX, wasn't it? Yeah. 
It was. It really was. Those seats were tiny. They were like sardines, though. I know. And, you know... It's a good other... age range of pe- people, though, watching it. Yeah, it was nice to see um, grandparents, kids, and, and their kids. Young and old. Young and old alike, watching an absolute classic. It was so good. Um, I yeah. kept saying to everybody, you've got to go and see yours in the cinema. Yeah, was, is that what you do? Oh, what? yeah. Yeah. I told my neighbour... Who also I work with, and they but they said yeah I've, I've seen it five hundred times. Well, no, already. he told his wife. He told his wife Vicky wants us to, wants us to go to the cinema, and she goes, "Why does Vicky want to take you to the cinema?" And he goes, "No, no, she wants us to go together." Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, those two, them two, together. them two. Oh my God, she must have thought weirdly about yeah, you. Yeah, she does for a split second, <laughs> probably for and a bit she longer. She was embarrassed. <laughs> you should be embarrassed if you're listening. <laughs> Won't say their names, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was that was our Jaws experience at the cinema, and I doubt it's going to be on IMAX again. But I think the next great thing to see on IMAX is probably going to be Avatar re-release, <laughs> or then Avatar two, three, four, and five, because there's going to be four sequels. <laughs> you love it, don't you? Yeah, Avatar. I love the yeah because James Cameron is is he's one of the masters of uh, storytelling, masters of movie making and you can't you got to respect that and the craft he is one of the best filmmakers ever because he's pushing the technology forward he's pushing 3d he's pushing imax he's pushing you know virtual filmmaking more so than anyone so you gotta have real belief in yourself and your ideas yeah absolutely only today i heard about he was getting he was getting studio notes from fox about Avatar, making it shorter yeah. and reducing how many flying sequences there were in it. And he's like, I'm not reducing... This was today, so today, uh, the day of recording of this, which is 20th... The day before it gets released, so 20th of uh, September. Um, he was giving studio notes to reduce the length and to reduce the flying sequences. But he said... To reduce cost? No, just to make the... So they could screen more films, screen it more. Mm. That's all. That's all you cut a film down to. It's nothing to do with anything else. It's about getting more people in more screens and more showings. Mm. That's what it is. You know what I mean? Business. But then he said, "I made Titanic. I paid for half this studio lot to be made. This five hundred million dollars studio. That that was that was all down to me. So I'm not cutting it. <laughs> that's what he said. But which is fair because he made one point eight billion with Titanic in ninety seven, and then he made three and a half billion with Avatar. So you got to respect the man." You know, give him what he deserves. He's going to make you billions. Has he made any duffs? Uh, financial duffs. I don't think so. True Lies is a lot of fun. There's, and uh, Ghost of the Abyss. He's done a lot of documentary stuff. There's a yeah, huge yeah. money maker. But, and the Abyss was magnificent. I'd like to see a HD version of that. That'd be great. HD. Um, oh, yes. My wedding ring's based, based on uh, Ed Harris's ring, isn't it? In it. Uh, so, yeah, that'd be great. Is that a horror? No, that's sci-fi. That it's not horror. Scary. The abyss. It is. It's scary of the unknown, but it's not horror unknown. It's definitely sci-fi. Sci-fi fantasy. <coughs> Sorry about that. So, what's the next horror we're going to see then? The next horror we're going to go and see is Jordan Peele's Nope in the cinema, and then I think it's something he directed or at least wrote, uh, which is Oz with. Uh, Lupita Nyong'o uh, so yeah we're looking forward to those two films I think we're going to go and see Nope at the tail end of this week hopefully depends we're both on got, feeling yeah both very very busy this week and see where we're at um, and see where we're at and uh, yeah hopefully check out Nope let's go and watch us Jordan Peele's a fantastic filmmaker let's go and watch us now alright let's go and watch us okay. now All right, bye see everyone bye 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 everybody bye 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 Can you you do a better version? I can.